Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming this evening. Uh, it's a beautiful evening here in Perth. Uh, we are here to look at, and I give you the title, Imagining a New Policy Agenda for Australian Arts and Culture. More about that in a moment. My name is Shamit Sagar. I'm the director of the UWA Public Policy Institute. I'm also a professor of public policy and political science at the university. I'm very pleased that many people have accepted the invitation to join us this evening, particularly coming from arts organizations, cultural institutions, government, business, and nonprofits. So you're very welcome in joining us this evening. Um, this is a discussion aided by our panel and their insights, but also your observations about Australia and its culture and its arts, both as a sector, but also as part of our identity. Uh, this is not something necessarily just up our flagpole. Of course, as you're aware, it's very timely at the point at which there's a national discussion taking place about a national cultural policy in 2023, led by new federal mm -hmm. minister, Tony Burke, and submissions for which just closed last month. Uh, and please keep an eye upon that uh, in the context of our discussion. Uh, UWA Public Policy Institute does many things. Um, one of the things we have produced earlier on this year is this publication, which I think you've been given a copy of as you came through. Uh, it sheds light on the kind of work we're doing. And if I can just say a little bit about the Institute, uh, you may be aware of the fact that research intensive universities all over the world have come under criticism in the last five or 10 years. Uh, the criticism is along the lines that they tend to keep themselves to themselves. They tend to be introspective and they're interested in research outcomes as an end in themselves. I think that's largely true. And for that reason, the university that I'm a member of took the decision a few years ago to establish this institute in conjunction with others, if I may say so, the newly formed Defense and Security Institute, the Data Institute, just to name two examples, in order to make sure that our research is translated in a timely way. It's placed not just in the hands of decision makers in government, business, and nonprofit, but also it enters the public realm and we are there, as it were, to foster public discussion. Um, this report is jam-packed with, if I recall rightly, 40 or 42 uh, short 800-word pieces looking at what the state's prospects might be in the middle part of this century. It covers prosperity, that speaks for itself. It also covers issues to do with place and environment, and fundamentally it deals with people, uh, who we are, where we are, who we might become, and that is, as it were, an evolving story. So I commend that report to you, and I also point out that one of the panelists are joining us this evening has made an important contribution, Jeremy, uh, to that, um, that report. And the last thing by way of introducing just the Institute is to point out that this is not something just that affects UWA itself. It is, as I said, something that is about research intensive universities all over. Uh, just two days ago, uh, Peter Shergold, uh, who you may be aware of the fact was the former head of the de Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and our federal government until quite recently, he's, when speaking at a very similar event, said, and if I can just quote, the uh, point about university research is it's highly relevant to the economic and social and cultural decisions the governments <coughs> make, and yet has limited impact on the decision makers that are involved in government. In other words, he's deeply regretting the irony of that. And we are part and parcel of the effort to push back, and as it were, to put right what for some, for what's for so long has been a problem in the way in which universities communicate. Well, the policy agenda we can talk about, but just a few nuggets just to get ourselves going and some facts to do with arts and culture. Uh, people often make the point that, you know, it's probably quite a small sector and that probably is exacerbated by the fact that we are in a resource and mineral state. Um, for what it's worth, uh, recent research produced by our colleagues at Curtin University estimated that it probably is a sector that here accounts for at most about $7.3 billion. Uh, put that in context, um, in a $362 billion economy, that puts this sector at about 2% of the whole. So that's probably an unfair comparison because, of course, it's dwarfed by the importance of uh, energy, minerals and resources. But it's important, nonetheless, to get a sense of the fact that that's the scale. In terms of jobs, that same study revealed that in the decade between 2006 and 2016, uh, the growth in jobs in Australia in the creative industries was nothing less than just short of 28%, in comparison with the overall jobs growth in, that, in this country in that decade of 17%, so a good 10, 11% larger. Uh, here in Perth, 
we're one and a one point six times more likely to have workers in the creative industries as compared with Australia as a whole. We're looking at actually participating and, and being patrons of these uh, industries. Uh, something like four in five West Australians reported that they attended a cultural event or venue in the last year, according to the Curtin study. And the value to West Australians and their willingness to pay appears to have increased in the course of the last decade. And then lastly, on the subject of money, bound to come up at some stage or the other, here in WA, we live in a comparative warm spot, whereby at least government funding for arts and culture has been higher than the national average, but on a per capita basis. Remember, we live in a state with very, very few people as compared with other states. Meanwhile, the per capita expenditure on arts and culture across the country as a whole has been declining in the course of the last 15 years. So there's some kind of good news and bad news. That's just by way of just getting us to focus on the raw numbers. But really to shed light on all this, we need people who are close to the creative sector and the creative industries. And for that reason, we've been able to, and I'm delighted to report, record, re recruit four individuals as follows. First of all, we have Oren Katz, who's an artist and director, and he's part and parcel of the Center for Excellence in Biological Arts that's based it here at UWA. Uh, more about him in terms of introduction in a moment. Secondly, we're very lucky to have Sheila Magadza, She's the executive director for culture and arts in the Department of Local Government in the Western Australian government. We previously knew her at the Institute as part of the Chamber of Arts and Commerce. Thirdly, on the home team at UWA, we have Dr. Catherine Noski, who's part of the School of Humanities at UWA, but also edits the Westerly magazine. And last but not least, already mentioned as part of the report, we have Jeremy Smith sat closest to me here, who's a senior producer uh, and he's part and parcel of performing lives here in WA. Uh, so in order to have this discussion, less about me, I'm just here to sort of prop up the first part of the discussion. And let me just point out that you're in the very capable hands of Dr. Chris Lynn. Uh, Chris himself holds a relatively recent PhD in English and Cultural Studies from UWA, but more importantly, he's part and parcel of the staff of the Public Policy Institute. Uh, Chris is sat farthest away from me, and while well, now, uh, hand him, hand it over to him as part of his duties as being the chair hot seat this evening. Uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Can you hear me? Yeah. I just wanted to start by just welcoming everyone um, to our conversation this afternoon, a chance to provide a public system, which I'm at the public debt at the EWO Public Policy Institute. It's our absolute pleasure to bring our institution to practice. To at large. Um, I also want to extend a warm welcome to our online audience as well, uh, who are uh, joining us online and will be engaging with us in the QA session a little bit later. Just to take you through some housekeeping, um, just as a thank you to the there is, or there weren't, but a, um, an emergency or any evacuations, we will get to charge for a few days and just to um, know the things that way and to my left. Um, also, just a way to the long session, we can do conversations as informal as possible. We need to allow panelists to riff off each other, to debate, to share ideas, you know, and have a little bit of fun with this as well. Um, but we will also have the opportunity to throw the conversation over to you as the audience for the last half an hour. So if there are any burning questions that you have, please um, keep them on board. And we get a chance to ask them to our brilliant audience. So, without further ado, we do have a stellar cast tonight. Um, and I'm really pleased that amongst our panel, we've got a of artists, uh, art producers, uh, public, uh, public advocates, and policy advocates, as well as researchers. We really have a good spread of, I suppose, um, artists slash art workers who are right at the corners of what it means to, I suppose, be both workable but also be affected by um, the creative industries and environment. Um, I'd like to just go to Charlotte's point of view by introducing our telecast. So I'll go all the way from my left, your right. Uh, firstly, there's Jeremy Smith. So Jeremy is a senior producer for the Performing Lives WA, where he works closely with WA's local arts. He's held four um, former roles with the Australian Council for the Arts, and as well as the general manager of the Jeremy's working life is in crossover arts funding, policy, sponsorship, and regional development across government, 
non profits and corporate businesses. Um, and just to give a shout out to performance lines, they produce provocative and rebellious contemporary performance. <laughs> and we um, you know we can work with supporting artists through all aspects of the industry. Next year, we have all of that. And all of is the co founder and director of Symbolo, which is a center of excellence for biological arts. In 1996, Orin co-founded the Chisu uh, Culture and Art Project with Nomad Servants Body. And as part of this project, they were the first to grow in 2000 and to eat in 2003, functionally. And in 2004, they took the end of the year for that role. Is this an intervention, Orin? <laughs> 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 Nothing's going to. <laughs> I work here as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all of the holds recent positions at the World College of Arts, Stanford University, and the Tissue Engineering and Fabrication Laboratory. At Harvard Medical School on some positions. He's curated exhibitions for world leading galleries um, all across the world. So they will welcome to Warren. Next on, we have Sheila McGatter. Sheila is the Executive Director of Culture and the Arts, Department of Local Government, Sport, and Cultural Industries. Sheila was also the former Executive Director of the Chamber of Arts and Culture at the Reagan, the state's industry art industry body. She has had an extensive career as an artistic director of Asia festivals, including Australasia's largest multi arts festivals in Perth and New Zealand. And directly opposite me, we have Kate. Kate is a student of the UWA School of Communities, she has a big theatre writing and literature. Kate is a war of restorer, and she twice awarded the Elaine Mitchell Prize for Rural Writers. She was shortlisted for the 2015 Dorothy Hill Award. And her novel, The Salt of Donna, was published by Ethan Moore in 2020, and shortlisted the WA Premier's Book Awards. Kate serves on numerous boards, including Wide WA and Lazy Story, and she is the editor of Western Magazine, which is the premier literary magazine on our West Coast. And I get to give a very warm welcome to our. As John mentioned in his introduction, you know, it's really it's quite a timely moment for us to be up with the baby art with the new uh, national cultural policy that is in train at the moment. The submissions for that closed in August, and I believe over 1,200 submissions have been, um, have been digested. And you know, on the other hand, we've also just hopefully coming out of the ravages of COVID as well. And hopefully, just sort of starting to see. Both artists and festivals and um, you know events starting to pick up again, and us as participants and audience you know, members looking to just re-engage with our space, especially because we've got to attend to the summer fest as well. So that's really where I want to start. I think it's a moment of hope and hopefully, also maybe a moment of presentation as well. So the question I'd like to start for our audience with is with the natural cultural policy in mind. What do you believe are the most pressing challenges facing the arts in Australia today? And what is the one thing that you would like to see addressed in the new policy? I will I'll step in there. Um, well, as you say, it's a, it's a fantastic time. And whilst you've raised this question, what are the challenges? I'm, I'm going to do that trite thing and say they're all opportunities as well. Um, I think, you know, the first thing that Australia is facing and has faced for some time is the issue of resolving at a very fundamental level its relationship with our Aboriginal people, the First Nations cultures of this country and, um, you know, how that frames our national conversation, our identity and the values that we ascribe to the culture that we, uh, we are creating collectively. I always think about arts and culture, we run it together, but culture in itself is, you know, is something to be brought about separately, I think, to arts and artistic expression. And so that overriding defining culture of our identity and the conversations that we want to have are fundamentally important. And I guess the other challenges um, kind of flow from that, which is the impact of this rapid social change. Mm -hmm. COVID has just accelerated a whole lot of the trends that we've seen and a lot of that is the expectation of our of our citizenship for the quality of their life and how they 
wish to access arts and culture within their own lives, um, but also the kind of global impacts of that. That um, is very closely related to technology, isn't it? Um, so we've kind of been at a printing press moment, I guess, for the last 20 years, which is the fundamental impact of technology and people's access to different knowledges, different cultures and different connections, but also different ways of creating um, some quite astonishing stuff that now sits way outside of the current models that we have for describing and grappling with our um, arts and culture sector. Um, I think the other thing that's quite um, evident through a lot of the research is the unevenness of access across mm. Australia from early childhood through to uh, very late in life. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it, it's very stark in that research that shows that people who have lower opportunity to access arts and culture attribute less value when they're surveyed on that question. So um, it's really important to look at who those, who those communities are. Um, and with a big dispersed uh, regional population, that's quite a big challenge, as well as the unevenness of socioeconomic uh, factors that affect that. Um, but also I think in that unevenness of access that we're possibly um, not looking at other areas where we could be facing arts and cultural experiences for people to include in their, in their lives. Um, and the last thing I guess is this really big issue I think that are related to all the things that I've just mentioned is the investment in our artists and our arts workers to address these challenges at a very profound level, not just a superficial level. And um, as any of you who are practicing artists know, you become a better writer or a better, better director by doing lots of directing and lots of writing. It's a it's something that you have to do over and over again to become the best at. Um, and we're not really uh, creating those pathways in the creative side of things. And now we are face facing this also on the other side of the balance sheet, a looming skills crisis in all of our technical production support services for various reasons that uh, was is shrinking, departing in crisis. Um, and so our actual ability to, to achieve some of these projects is at risk. Can I my answer is picks up on quite a few of those things as well, Chair, in the sense that um that, that first point we started with the, the value of art, we're pretty familiar with our view for the value of art in, in social and cultural terms of <laughs> um, and, and, and sort of what it achieves is a cultural work, and the sort of vital social narratives that offers the space for contesting ideas, and uh, in the same way, the space for representation of diversity. Um, I think the, the challenge I see in that and coming away from that notes, notes that importance in the sense of uh, needing to recognise as well the generosity of that practice from First Nations activists and ensuring that the policy we develop is uh, both respectful of that space and uh, engaging with it in positive ways. Uh, and in the same way, ensuring that this work on the level uh, of, of nation really, it's not exclusively deferred to the arts. And I think this connects to what you're saying about the unevenness uh, of access as well. Uh, the sense that um, the arts in, in conversations can at times be siloed off as this sort of social and cultural domain. And uh, so the, the intervention I'd be really interested in seeing is ensuring that there are some whole government solutions to arts policy and to this, this question of what the arts achieves, the value of the arts, which uh, ensure that we're, what we know is, is the value of the arts uh, and the impact of, of what the arts offers. Uh, is enacted in, in short and generative and productive ways uh, with connections through the education and uh, in broad areas of um, policy. Um, and in part of that's coming out of an anxiety that we didn't see a lot of discussion of the arts as, as a vehicle for achieving real world change in the last election. There's lots of talk about climate crisis and um, the inequities of, of social opportunity, but there's not a lot of talk about how the arts can contribute to addressing some of those things. Um, and the only of access that we know, I think, is, is part of that question. If I may. <clears throat> yeah. 
Sorry, yeah, I think we, we've got it so many times. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I already did my mic. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, just briefing on your point. So, so Australia is a really interesting place mm. in terms that we have the oldest knowledge in the world mm. that is in risk of disappearing. And we are one of the earliest adopters of new technologies, as you mentioned. And, and I think what, what we're facing and where art can actually contribute a lot, and that's really being discussed, it's, it's not just the uh, digital technologies that we need to engage with. There's so much technologies that are accelerating to such an extent that we as a culture and a society can't come to terms with. And, and the role of art is making sense of it and, and, and bring meaning to those changes and, and try to point the finger at places that we have no language to describe is really important and, and if we don't pick up on it you know we will be sort of will be left behind things will kind of just wash over us in, in such a way that we would wish that we would have a, the artists to actually kind of show us where we might go and what we can do <laughs> <laughs> um yeah look i think uh, one thing i was going to offer on this um response which sort of i guess encapsulates a lot of the comments that have been said both so far is that we just can't go back. I think there's an opportunity to reset that. I think um, there's been so much that has been wrong in our past, be it to our most people, be it to climate action, be it to inclusion, be it to all forms of tourism, be it, be it to, I guess, the haves and the have-nots and cutting up of the pie. I think this is a really important and timely moment to reset. Um, I think as a sector, we need to be a lot more comfortable with embracing disruption and, um, you know, I, I guess discomfort, because I think there will be really crunchy moments coming up when we have to um, change the way that we do things and the way that we relate and act, and make and create and play and do all those sorts of things. Um, and I think, you know, there's been a big rise in more recent times, I think, as a result of the pandemic of activism and, you know, this thing enhancing that energy and how we can sort of build that into a better, more sustainable um, future for. Uh, artists, organisations, and audiences as, as a whole. I mean, picking up on something that Sheila said, I think even looking at it, like one big thing that's happening at the moment is I think everyone, be that artists, be that organisations, be that venues, be that our nation, um, and be that hunters are so inward focused and inward gazing that we're just starting to see that outward gaze return. Um, which is where you know people are looking to explore and really like new partnerships and you know attendance has been low. I mean, I think when there's free events, people are just not showing. Um, and that's been a really significant big thing. We found that recently through our Collier program. Um, so I guess it's going to take time for people to, I don't know if it's a confidence issue or whatever, but it's a really big um, shift that we've noticed through a lot of our free programs that um, there's just been a really big um no show rank really, which I think for our sector that relies on participation and relies on attendance is really quite significant. So, um. and can I just add to that as well that you know a large part of arts and culture is at a community level, mm -hmm. and that's driven by volunteering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not even about paid jobs, mm -hmm. and a lot of those volunteers are people who were affected by them. Yeah. So. Um, there's a real danger of the loss of some of those opportunities as well. Thanks very much. It shows us that there's plenty to play for um, both with the new cultural policy and but also just more broadly as well. I'm only got two of those key words that came out of the response to that. They provided one was around value and the second was around access. So I was one of those two. So I believe my next question was to say, that the value of arts is often framed in terms of economic benchmarks. Um, what it adds to the economy, therefore, how much money it is worth. I don't want to overestimate that or necessarily the um, But I put the economic value of the art understanding. What about the powers? How are we bringing in other ways of framing the value of the arts? Well, so maybe in a way that moves to the idea of arts as a public good. So that's to say, to exist independently of the normal life. Um, one thing that came up during Collion, which at Collion, for those that have been with is a, um, it's been a three year initiative, which the Public Lines um, instigated by listening to independent artists at the heart of the pandemic in 2020 um, to make space, time, and um, freedom for, for artists to 
connect and play and, and, and you know, um, I guess, reconnect with the sector and organisations and venues and life beyond uh, lockdown. And one of the things that I think when we ran a session at this year's event about um, the national cultural, cultural policy consultation process was there's a real alignment for I think part of what we recognise as workers with the portfolio that um, Minister Burke has, um, which I don't think is anything that's really sort of truly been nailed before. So I think that's really um, goes to these things too, I guess, around, um, you know, <clears throat> the economic prospects of the arts, but then also identifying and recognising those people that make up that workforce are workers and not just hobbyists or, you know, doing things, to, you know, um, to whatever's sake, I guess. So, um, yeah, and I think the other part of that too, which is something that I sort of learned a real, a lot about in my former lives, um, both as a creative producer, but then also in the portfolios that I have at the Australian Council was the importance um, and recognition of cultural practice, be that by First Nations people, be that, you know, like in Sydney, was working with a lot of diaspora from Pacifica and other communities that just get together and make their cultural practice together, you know, and that's really something that falls through the cracks in terms of recognition of the impact of what our sector um, to the as well. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so maybe I'll use an example just, uh, you know, it's obviously that uh, this idea of uh, trying to monetize everything that happens around us is an issue. And, and by in getting involved in this conversation, you already lost the debate. If you are dealing with something that cannot be easily monetized. So you, you think about kind of the, in the conservation movement, where they start to talk about kind of ecosystem services. Uh, that you can monetize, you actually lost a lot of conservation because you put a value, dollar value to, to natural assets. And by that, if you can make more money out of them in another way, that can happen. You already opened up this conversation. And, and I think it's the same in culture. You know, so human culture always existed before money and before we monetize things. And there's no way we can start to think about it in those terms without losing the essence of what culture is which is much bigger than just being to able to quantify it in, in, in such a way. And so, and, and there's a really interesting aspect that our art, one of the roles that art plays is to shine a mirror back at society. You have to keep your distance in order to be able to have the reflection. If you play the game, you're already part of the reflection, you're not the mirror. I think too what, what you mentioned there in terms of the yeah, that discrepancy between the views of the economic and, and the views of art uh, in its own right. Points a little bit to uh, something that tends to be have to um, suggest economic value versus public good in the dichotomy. I don't think it's that simple. Uh, there's there's a sense when realistically that they're not going to be sure the next person. Uh, and that those those systems are the ways in which we've shifted to see art and economic terms have developed in such you know with such complex histories as, as you know that uh, it's untangling them now is, is impossible uh, and um, I, I think you see that a little bit in the sense that the immediate public good that appealed to me alongside that sense of marriage I mean, it's beautiful point uh, is the possibilities for community building that exist around the arts and that exists uh, both uh, sort of inclusively to the sector and sort of community building internally um, and community building externally to the centre which which you know, sits across those frames of bringing in people and getting bums on seats and, and that sort of structure that's more usually seen on an economic scale uh, and in the same way um, that you know the, the former the, the community building internally to the sector depends on economic development the, the latter of community building externally Expanding the scope of the arts and increasing contact with it depends on audience correlation, which requires investments. All these things are really quite deeply entangled. Uh, it, it's so that, that I don't know that those dichotomies between public good and, and the current structure are that simple or that useful, really, when we're thinking about this dilemma and how we articulate and how the arts work. Mm. Um, some of the issue is, is about the lack of language and tools to describe and mm. measure arts and culture and <clears throat> people think about it as intangible and I'm looking at Tabitha here because um, she's very familiar with the work of John Smithies over at the Cultural Development Network who tried to make that uh, more tangible by creating five cultural measures so that there were cultural outcomes that were important in their own right because we do have I mean other 
tangential things that we measure like mental health and well-being is obviously a, an area of great impact, impact on education, etc. But he, he had these five measures that are creativity has been stimulated. Um, well, these are outcomes, sorry, that you can measure. Aesthetic enrichment has been experienced. Knowledge, ideas or insight has been gained. Diversity of cultural expression has been appreciated and a sense of belonging to a cultural heritage has been deepened. And he argues that if you if you build those in as your expected outcomes from the, the, the investment or the work that you're doing, you can measure that from uh, as outcomes and report against it. And this was picked up um, in a conversation that we were having yesterday uh, with someone who deals a lot across local government and kind of how to embed uh, the appreciation or the importance of cultural planning within local government. And, he said, well, of course, the key thing is that local governments are not required to report against any of their cultural activity. They have to report against their rubbish and their climate action and their, but there is nothing reportable for them to uh, put forward. So, of course, it slips down their priorities. So, if you could somehow give people tools and measures um, against which they can report, then possibly we could demonstrate that value. The dirty quotas work. Thanks for the you. Just a quick up on the target. I think I was just getting closer to the device, and that's okay. We just get to report the audience online so we can hear. All we need to have right here. So I want to move the conversation a little bit to something that came out of Shiva's response and something that Jeremy mentioned as well, which is the importance of play. Actually, you mentioned obviously if you want to be a director, you need to be a writer, or any form of artist, you need to do those things and you need to be in an environment where experimentation, risk taking, and failure as you know, look, uh, are encouraged and um and sort of leveraged in that way. So um, I want to quote something from Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you previously say that we'd love to see a policy environment for our arts and cultural sectors that acts bravery, encourages boldness, and really shakes up the concepts and scales we can sell when making, creating, and playing. Can you elaborate on these ideas a little bit, especially when they're called to play and experimentation? Yeah, I think um, so much of what we do in the sector is informed by caps and informed by criteria and informed by other forms of um, guidelines, I guess. And so quite often they're quite condensed and squashed. And so I think as a sector, we sometimes don't know how to be big and how to, you know, be bold and ambitious and play and, and do all sorts of things, I think, because we are always sort of going to the smaller pieces of the pie. It's funny, like when I was at the Australian Council, the first time I went through my portfolio was the longest I broke stationary. I had sort of my title was the Arts Practice Director for Community Arts and Culture Development and Emerging Experiments and Arts. Um, <laughs> I used to call it the Southern New Australia because it was all sort of parts of the, the sector that no one else really wanted to follow in the field with. Um, and so I remember the first time we went through an annual reporting process. I saw the pie kind of that while I was programming the organization, but um, and there was this one little sliver of the pie called Cross Arts. And um, I sort of said, What's that? And they just said, That's your portfolio. And I sort of said, Is that because I'm fucking angry? We get so little. <laughs> and I think that's because a lot of work in that space around community practice, around experimental practice. Is really rich and really coming edge and really exciting around the sorts of things like oh, Rob is a rock star and see we're going to say that now. I mean, the work that's in the Lady Group has done um, and many others that have been pioneers in Western Australia and in Australia with the space that um, have been bold and dreamt big and just gone out and really broken and shaken up what we consider to be the norm in, in arts practice here. And I think that um, pursuing those opportunities through you know, collaborations and through bringing together other forms of support is rather than sort of a piecemeal approach that is fun, but that is prescribed by individual funding programs. Um, but then having said that, I know there are, have been programs, for instance, in um, Victoria, which have encouraged boldness and bravery that have failed because artists weren't ready for it. And they haven't been able to sort of put together the, the sort of applications and then deliver that because that was really significant substantial sums of money 
So I guess it's that bar balance of being able to, um, you know, an experiment to ask this and value is so important. Um, yes, so well, did they really fail? Did the Victorian program really fail, yeah. or you learned a lot from it? In a sense well, exactly, that's right, yeah. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. I mean, the other thing which I think we don't have nearly enough on scholarships. Well, something we want our viewers to play an experimentation on, actually, whether it's your audience, okay? You can be, maybe talk to the audience a little bit about the work you do as an artist, and also the work you do with Smile, Smile, which is a really fascinating example of, of what art can do in cross disability environments. Right, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I suppose in general, my interest towards life and how our relationship to life is changing and shifting and how new knowledge about life. And, and, and you know, you can insert anything else to do with new knowledge that we gain as, as you, humanity is kind of progressing with a quest to understand the world around us. But in my case, it's life and life is a very fundamental question that I think is very connected to the arts. And so I decided to park myself in a biological science department in a research university or in a research setting in order to see how life is now being transformed into a raw material to be engineered and the issues that are stemming from there. But one really interesting thing that comes out of that is, is the fact that uh, by life becoming kind of this subject for human manipulation, it also opens up an extremely problematic new palette for artistic exploration. And, and this is what we've done at Symbiotica. We basically invited artists to come and spend time in the lab to understand what's going on with life in the context of the scientific and engineering research and, and be playful about it and, and see where it might take us in order to raise questions. Do you have that concept of life a little bit more to start the materiality of so when you say you work with life? So, so the main interest of the United Nations when we started working with the Tissue Culture and Art Project back in 1996 actually came from particular image that hit the media in 1995, and that was of the mouse that had the human ear growing through its back. I don't know if you remember seeing it. It was an amazing image because human culture, almost all human cultures, I think all of them, have images of this human animal hybrid. It exists in our psyche. We, and suddenly in 1995, you see a naked mouse, or a mouse with no hair, with a human ear growing from its back. Basically, it's the surrealist come, the dreams come alive, it's everything that you can imagine that our kind of nightmares and our, our dreams were made of. And, and it's on the TV screen, made by scientists in Harvard University or in Boston. And I said, you know, scientists did it. I think it's the work of artists to figure it out. Because what they've done was to sculpt with living biological material. And again, it's for better or for worse. And, and we wanted, and, and I think we all kind of share the idea that a lot of what drives artists is to engage in things that they find uncomfortable. Yeah. So, so you want to grow. It's like you have an itch. You want to figure out um, where it's going, how it's being done. Uh, so the technology of choice that you had myself chose was the very same technology that was done to create a year on the back of the mouse, which is called tissue engineering. And that's technology that uh, was basically very crafty. Uh, it's about sculpting a living tissue using almost like a loss wax, like a jewelry system of loss wax, uh, where you basically start with a degradable polymer that you shape in whatever organ you're trying to replace, and then you seed it with the tissue and the cells of that organ, and supposedly you, you, you have a new organ. It's not working like that. Biology is way more complicated, mm -hmm. but it gives a new palette for artistic sculpture with living biological tissues. So we started that, we, we knocked on the door of the scientist at UWA, and rather than kicking us out, she invited us in, and we learn the techniques ourselves. And this is another thing. It's like a lot of what's happening in science and technology is actually not rocket science. Artists are way more adapted to engage and have the craft to be able to do those things um, because of our training. And so we, we spent time in UWA and we spent a year in Harvard Medical School with the very same scientists that did a mouse on the respect because you, know, you want to go to the source, you want to understand. Um, and there we found ourselves doing things like growing meat in the lab as a statement in regard to what kind of relationship we're going to have with, uh, you, you know, you, you can't get more intimate with another living being than incorporating it and making it part of your body by eating it. So that was our interest. And then a decade later, a scientist did it, adopting our kind of performative techniques as well uh, as a performance in, uh, in, in London. Uh, so we've done that. We, we grew wings out of the uh, pig tissue, and by that created the first pig wings because 
some of the promises of those new technologies make us wonder if things could fly one day. Yeah. So, so we wanted to to see what shape those wings would take. So, and but symbiotica itself, I must say, was much broader than just working with living tissue because our interest was what's happening to life from the molecular level to the ecological level. And the idea was to place artists, to work with scientists, not, uh, and, and that was something that was extremely important for us. I think it's extremely important when we think about kind of the role of the arts, always treat the artists as equals. So when we started, we were guests and we had to ask favors. We managed to set up Symbiotica as a place where the artists are equal to all of the other researchers around them, where they can ask the question, they can probe and they can do the research without feeling that they're uninvited guests. Is that sort of value for the Sorry? Is that sort of value for the artist for the artist? So, so the value is really opening up, you, you know, I, I, I tend not to celebrate what I refer to as the secondary outcomes. I think the interesting thing is the type of uh, articulation and development of uh, at least pointing out the fingers at the things that we need more cultural scrutiny of. Because we shouldn't leave those decisions just in the hands of scientists and engineers and government and business people. We, we really need to open this debate. And, and I think artists, again, are really well poised in doing so. But the secondary outcome is opening up the minds of the scientists to realize that their research can go to places that they never imagined, uh, to realize that there's ways in which uh, solving the problems that they are facing can, there's other ways to do it. Artists are always kind of improvisers and, and they try to find ways to, to solve problems we, without a solutionist approach, because the problems trying to solve are about how we create more awareness, how we identify things that we need to investigate further, in a sense, from a cultural perspective. Yeah. 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 And so I was sort of wondering if you could bring on what value the benefits of literary storytelling bring to you know, the lives of communities that you work with. And speaking of this perspective on small art organization, what leaders are needed from government to help support small art organization projects? Ideas to come into contact with the world, to form, to form, to form, to form, to form, to form. 
Um, and um, for, for multiple voices to be heard in multiple forms of the uh, So that's really what we say is, is really um, and, and the benefit that most of it offers. In terms of challenges, to make a big challenge in this is really uh, precarity that small organizations um, face the inability for a small organization to work with a long term strategy because of that precarity. Uh, and I want to move just um, the reason I'm not working on notes is that I think there's some important points to make and there's a lot of great that down. And um, that that precarity is uh, recognizing from the perspective and also those perspectives that we're hugely privileged in our funding. We have been wonderfully supported and uh, not just by the University of Western Australia and host of scholars, um, but also by the department uh, at a state level, DLGC. Uh, by the Australia Council of the Arts and Finance, uh, federal level, uh, by the Copyright Producers Cultural Fund, and other funds like that. We've, we've really uh, enjoyed a wonderful range of support and bodies uh, recognizing what we're doing and backing them. Um, but that at least demonstrates uh, the sort of burden that comes from seeking that funding. That's multiple and concurrent <coughs> applications on a regular basis. We're submitting at minimum four and usually around six applications a year. Uh, that's in the afternoon, approximately 110 hours of labor living. Uh, and we're a team of less than one full time person. <laughs> so uh, we currently combine 0 0.7 FTA in our team. Uh, that's editorial, admin staff, the whole kit and um, Alongside that, we have some external staff in the library, uh, sort of uh, a body of advisors who, who do contribute, but that's volunteer labor then on top of. What is encompassed in that data? Okay. So this this burden of seeking funding consumes time, which might be otherwise directed to our core purpose. Time, which is very valuable, it's still coming for a small staff group. Uh, it also creates a huge level of fatigue and stress, uh, in the sense that uh, there is a really low level of success in this process. Those applications are highly competitive, and it's really disillusioning when you you know you put in a strong application and it's not back multiple times. Um, it's also recognising that it's difficult to stand out constantly in articulating that value when you're writing applications again and again across the year. Uh, and um, there's this pressure to feel like your applications constantly need some big new shiny thing. So when you're submitting an application, you're looking for support and advocating for this big new shiny thing, you don't have the pressure of maintaining that to acceleration in your evolution and production, constantly expanding uh, in ways which really isn't sustainable when you come back to. Considering the core purpose and, and the work that it takes to keep this up. Um, and I'm recognizing, having said that at the start, that we're very privileged in this front. So if we're feeling like that, if we're feeling like that pressure, <laughs> we really need to think what it's like for other organizations who have not been so well supported. Uh, and what it's like, particularly for individual artists who are facing that same slog and, and you know, their income, they really need to fit themselves. It's reliant on that. Treadmill process of constantly trying to attract project funding in the year out. Coming out of that, there's an issue, so we'll then have a load of, of managing uh, and equipping those grants. So, on top of those, we have six applications every year. For every successful application, you have an official form of selection to look at as the outcome is set. Uh, so, the workload uh, for a small arts organization is huge. I'm sure you guys can, can speak to that as well. Um, and the precarity that comes with that workload is enormous because each of these applications are for usually over 12 months at most. So the ability to plan long term and work long term and jumping from application to application is absurd um, and, and really, really difficult. Uh, so, what I'm, I'm really interested in this cultural policy review, really, and I think it's incredibly important, uh, is Seeing some conversation between uh, sort of the state and federal level around a cohesive funding structure, not necessarily a combined program of funding, but some recognition of how those sort of facets and elements of funding work in cohesion and work together, uh, and the ways in which that can um, facilitate and reduce precarity for small organisations. Um, and recognising too that I'd really like to see a funding body supporting based business. Not uh, requiring that, that new shiny thing, but recognizing, I suppose, the sort of non sexy realities of what it takes to produce art. 
Community-based staff to come and add in those sorts of base organisation and function that's really necessary for our ability to be able to create that kind of value, uh, but does not so well in <laughs> quantum education. It's really hard to make any of the That's a great podcast title. <laughs> <laughs> Unsexy realities. <laughs> I think, I think those are things that I see needing yeah. to change the believers, but that's a bit of a change for everyone. Um, but I don't know if you get it, it's, I'm sure that a lot of people can relate to more than you think us. So, I mean, you've talked a little bit about what state and federal government can do, but we don't have a federal government that can do more than that. But I want to just really stress you, usually, because there's now a county government, and what you think in that owners can't call it just one can you talk a little bit about some of the work you and the department have been doing to support our organizations and support the need for organizations? Yeah. Um, and I just want to just acknowledge what you said because it is the holy grail. If we could align not only uh, federal, state, but also local government. Um, and there are some terrifying yeah. stories, especially in Aboriginal control organizations, about a number of different. Um, parts of government they engage with to, you know, get all the funding together to do what they do. Um, it is one of the key challenges, I think, for, for all of us. So in terms of talking about what the government is doing at the moment, um, obviously we're coming out of a, a, a difficult period, but, you know, some of the key priorities that came uh, for government went into still stand and are now coming back onto the table. Um, and in terms of where we are with the arts and cultural policy, the I guess one of the one of the big ticket items that's above everything is this um, question about diversifying the WA economy over the next decade. It's not um, a new conundrum, as former premier here will be very familiar with. Um, but you know the question of the boom bust cycle around uh, dependency on the resource um, sector. Um, it's a difficult thing to. A difficult conversation to have at a time of boom when resources in terms of labour and everything are being sucked into what is, you know, clearly a, a very hungry sector at the moment. But I guess the recognition that the two percent is is tiny, and that curtain uh, research was very really interesting because yes, it's two percent, but it's a very important two percent, and it's a catalyst into a lot of other parts of the economy that it may not directly be measured as creating the cultural industries, but it, it does kind of leapfrog those skills into other areas. So that's, um, you know, a, an area of key interest. And within that um, are a, a bundle of cultural industries that uh, have been identified as potential for development. First one of the rank is screen and the film sector. It's been recognised that we are behind um, in terms of the rest of Australia, in terms of what we have in infrastructure here, but also the mechanism, mechanisms we have to attract film to the state. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of free money flying around the road over the recent years, and now it's looking for a home. A lot of it is going into investment in film. There's obviously a lot of platforms from the content. So um, the state is still in discussion about the development of the studio, but it has already launched an incentive program that will hopefully bring external investment in film to the state, as well as stimulate the local production companies. Um, and I don't know if you saw that last night, the first Disney Plus commission um, of the uh, Shipwreck Hunters premiere, which was a really big thing for us. Documentary and factual being one of the strongest areas of film production in the state. Um, so that's been a, a big learning curve for me, I have to say, coming from the background I have and then moving into government. Um, the other thing is the investment in childhood and young people. So there's a commitment towards creative learning to try and investigate a kind of longer term proposition on how we might bring back access to creative learning opportunities in schools. Um, not only to expose kids to arts and culture experiences, but also to develop tools in terms of creative thinking that they can carry as lifelong skills, whether they choose to go into a creative pathway in their own careers or just, you know, apply those in their lives in terms of resilience, mental health and other um, professional outcomes that may come through. Um, the regions is also still a very strong area of focus um, and that is supported by the regional uh, waters and regions money, which is an incredible um, asset that we have to invest in the regional communities. And I think, um, you know, that is becoming more and more 
um, sophisticated in terms of acknowledging that regional communities need to, it's a quality of life issue that needs to be accessible across the state as much as possible. Also, the interrelationship with tourism and the growth of cultural events across the state. Diversity and inclusion um, has been um, a key policy area for some time now, and I think we see a great results there both in the development of audiences and people on stage and lots to celebrate in um black swan and with festivals production julia hales who's just had standing ovations all the way through the uk and sydney with um, that incredible production and then of course um what you've alluded to the sustainability of the sector into the longer term um how it can be addressed but one of the things i would also say that code has has kind of illuminated for us is that uh, the state is heavily engaged with the sector uh, through funding. So the funding part of the sector was also very kind of close um, and visible. But what we didn't really understand or have such a you know a grip on was the commercial sector, mm -hmm. who were impacted sometimes um, far worse than any in Bico. And what that's brought up then is what are the conditions we need to put in place for the um, security of that commercial sector who don't receive funding but still need an operating environment that will support them to thrive. One of the interesting things there about the curtain um, research again is that we're a net importer of uh, cultural product. Um, but pre-COVID pre 2018, we had the highest per capita spend on performing arts in the whole country. So we clearly are very engaged. And so one of the things that interests me is, we, yes, we need to focus on our own artists and friends that we produce here, but we can also facilitate through our investment in infrastructure and you know good things bringing stuff into the state and making this a good destination for external stuff because the reality is we are still small um we're never going to be able to compete with some of the bigger players but we can um reach out and make connections nationally and globally still through our institutions if we're equipped to do that well thanks very much i'll be able to answer the um i think it's good to be when we ask those what's priorities for state government um, in that space. I want to draw attention to something that Jeremy, you mentioned for all the conversation, which is to say, to our expectations too about this that our national cultural policy will bring in terms of what government can achieve as well. Government can only be playing a certain role within that. There are other key players that must step up as well to a degree. I'm going to leave you to my final question before I call out to the audience, which is something that's been key on the edges of our conversation a little bit. Um, it's this is all about reliance on the resources sector, you know, and that's not unique to us, I think that's maybe a quarter more generally, but um, reliance on the resources sector that boosts arts money is perhaps going to be a problem for the arts community, but in terms of diversity of funding. So, how much funding is too much, and you know, what might we do to the rest of this kind of reliance on the resources sector? And is there a risk of um, soft self -search? <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> and that's something inherently Western Australian in the sense of the way that our sector and ecology and you know financial model has grown. And you know, it is a problem as I said, it's been a while space this. And I think people are now considering the impact of their decisions and um what is it to be um you know, ethical around giving, around partnering, and around um, accepting money from <coughs> services, be that individual organisations and, um, you know, a lot of things, a lot of what it may collective. Um, through that role, we've developed a really comprehensive um, ethical um, partnering framework, which is available, which they've generously offered to the sector and um, is, is on their website, for particularly independent sites to use. Um, but then I respect personally on the level of those organisations and the individuals that choose to still, you know, accept funding and, and, and use that to still create and make their work as well. So um, I think I need to sort of, I, I, I'm a former employee of Rio Tinto and I do a lot of work in the community and this and so that's um, part of the, the background that I bring to this sort of conversation too. And look, had I not spent that five years in that organisation, um, you know, very different area to where it is now. I would not be the person that I am now, knowing the things I do and knowing how to work with not from the sector. So I do know that there are good people in those organisations that are doing really good stuff and they are, you know, um, uh, uh, 
giving it a red hot go to the main things better for the, the partners that they work with in the non profit sector. Yes, the money's not right. Yes, they don't do really good things in terms of environmental impact, First Nations communities and, and other um, parts of our society. But that's, um, I think we're a long way from being able to cut the cord with that. Um, maybe I should blab also on 25th of October, the Chamber of Art and Culture actually has a full day mm -hmm. session around ethical investment in the arts. So you should, if you're interested in those questions, uh, let me explore further. Um, my interest in this is a policy we made at Symbiotica that we would refuse funding from pressure groups. So anyone that is trying to influence the way we do things that try to harm our integrity and autonomy, even the perceived one, uh, would be an issue for us to receive funding. For. So we refuse funding from the people for ethical treatment of animals, as well as from biotech companies. Yeah. So it's not one side of the, the game or the other. It's, it's how you maintain your integrity and your autonomy as an artist to be able to do things. And, and it is very perceptual as well. It's like, what, what's the optics of, of, of getting that? So I, I think we need to find a mechanism where art can still benefit from those people who have too much money and they want to, you know, Put park it somewhere, uh, but it's had to be in such a way that the artists would maintain uh, the autonomy. Um, yeah, just to pick up on what you're saying, Aaron, I, I think um, it's a complicated question in the Western Australian context, in particular, because we are a small, close knit sector with complex relationships between organisations and institutions. I could say that Westerly is not taking. Uh, funding from the resource sector, but we see it within WA, within WA is taking funding from the resource sector. So the complicity in the levels of complicity uh, in those questions is, is difficult to navigate and very really complicated. Uh, that said, I think, and, and this might be part of the distinction that you're drawing, Maureen, uh, there needs to be some recognition of uh, recognizing that, working through that, considering that, taking that on board, uh, and trying to build. Uh, the future for the sector that is sustainable, bearing that question in mind, and participating in arts washing, which uh, is, uh, you know, both something quite important and, and really ironic when we're talking about arts and culture sector, when what is often being washed and cleansed is the destruction of culture um, in other ways. Um, so there's there's a really deep paradox in that question for the arts sector, particularly in the WA's community, particularly I don't think we saw in the answers panel necessarily, except to say that it's something we'll have to get in mind. Is there a change in this third sheet? Just a, a small observation, which is this picture of the social dividend mm. um, and how that has built into a lot of business models, particularly international businesses. It's interesting. Um, but the idea of social dividends sometimes is an explicit in uh, local uh, businesses. And so, um, yeah, it's interesting just to see how, how different business models work. Yes, so much. I think it's okay to it's important to recognize this complex relationships, maybe the point about, you know, drawing a lot better grass as well. Um, but I might leave it there because I want to leave enough time to. Uh, here from you in the audience, uh, just a point of clarification as well. Or in the event that you mentioned on the 25th of October, that was in fact a whole day symposium yeah. on ethical arts funding hosted by the uh, Chamber of Arts and Culture at WA. So, if anyone's interested, I'm going to check the one at the end. I'd like to hand it over to you. Um, I'm just talking there. Aren't I? <laughs> So uh, I can just also be fast. Just going to be hands for like ask a question, and we want to get you as many questions as possible. So can you please stay with it, and then um, direct it to one of our audience for the audience to catch. Hello, thank you uh, for the conversation. I've been reporting on the arts in Western Australia for thirty years, and I find this conversation rather disappointing. I mean, I receive uh, emails still from uh, organisations, including the one that you uh, led, uh, Sheila. And just earlier this year, they talked about the fact that in the survey they ran, it highlighted that 63% of participants had immediate issues with their operating costs, totaling 30 million. The survey also recorded that 50%, half of small to medium uh, arts bodies, uh, will be operating uh, on reserves or in some cases will cease operations within the next 12 months. These are 
real figures from the chamber itself. Um, when I first came to the WA, I would argue there was more coverage of the arts than there is now. Art practice is not seen, it's not heard, it's not analysed, it's not critiqued in a way it was even when I came here. The media has uh, media outlets have diminished, and I commend Cecil, for example, as a small but really valiant attempt to cover uh, the issues. After 30 years, we are at a point where giant corporate giants in mining and resources are the major sources of funding. And I take your point, Kate, about people having to put in funding applications. I would argue that four to six a year is infinitesimal compared with the kind of funding applications people are having to make. And very often it's to corporate giants. So to your point, Oren, about cultural scrutiny, we'll try that when uh, your sponsor comes from a certain section that perhaps doesn't want to have an analysis of some of the, uh, the issues. Uh, community building, it requires artists who can actually make a living and also have a venue. Spare Parks Public Theatre has just lost that venue. Yet one decade ago, it went to one of the first most respected architectural firms. In fact, I think it was the one that designed our state theatre company and came up with a plan for a building. A decade on, nothing, nothing's happened. Um, we have no Indigenous cultural centre yet. And yet, for the, all the 30 years that I've been here, there has been a growing network of Indigenous art centres um, that is unrivaled by the rest of the nation, but we have not capitalised or taken account of that sufficiently. At Warburton, the biggest community-owned collection in the nation exists there. They have toured to China almost exclusively off their own bat. One of the biggest uh, tours to China that's ever been held of Indigenous art. Um, there, so my plea, I think, is um, for all that this is a difficult uh, period, I take your point in some ways, Sheila, we have a massive surplus in this state and diversifying the economy, I agree, is essential. But could we please look at government and uh, uh, the commitment of this government in encouraging this community of West Australians to look at our art sector and fund it properly and encourage it properly and to not just have us waiting for a generation for a new museum, which we did, um, and wait still for decent and major investment in a decent art gallery, which we still haven't had. So my plea is for for all the artists out there, I feel for them, and I think it deserves a lot more funding. I will just say one thing, which I didn't leave off my list, the Aboriginal Cultural Centre is in, in train. I don't know if you're doing it before that one. Thank you. And if I may, Vicky, thank you so much for raising those things. The first point that I had here was the visibility of the arts and the media, which we don't have. Can you help us with it? <laughs> <laughs> so how can we do it? Because it's obvious, I, I know with my own experience, I got international TV crews shooting my, my shows here in Perth. It wasn't even a mention. The only mention I got in West Australia was a caricature on the page two uh, of me growing uh, Kevin Rudd on the back of the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so the level of uh, media engagement, and we have to cite some stories that you made. Well. What do you ask the government to separate your department of culture and the arts to put their subsidy in for coverage of arts events, blankets? Everywhere. You've got a you've got a bicentennial coming up in which the government is planning to spend money on arts activities, but you need money now. Sorry for the second. question up there, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the discussion this evening. I wanted to talk about influencing wider government policy to support work-life balance that can then facilitate more people being having the time and the money to engage with either by volunteering or attending art and cultural events and programs. A lot of people feel so run off their feet that they can't engage with this sector. So can we influence policy so people have the time to engage with this sector? 
I, I can pick that one up and, and thank you for that question. And I think to thank you for giving your points as well. It's part of what is very helpful there in that, that investment is part of the answer to that, that question. So it's, um, there, there's a particular relationship going on there between work life balance for arts workers, recognizing that. You know that that shortfall in precarity, that shortfall in, in labour, isn't it? By volunteer work, yeah. kind of pretty much all the time, mm -hmm. uh, and the burden of that volunteer work kind of being passed on to the participants mm -hmm. on, on quite a regular basis is part of what is inhibiting uh, the balance and the ability to engage uh, in, in much more important types of work. And I, look, I think part of the reason. Uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm speaking publicly about these questions of what we want in policy that I, I don't um, want to simply shout and scream for more money, which is sort of what I want to invite, is this sense of um, a little bit of preaching to the choir, that the conversations I'm having in the audiences I'm having them with uh, are very much the people who feel that already too. Uh, and that these questions of, of looking for greater investment to, and wanting greater investment to meet all of these concerns, meet that greater value, meet greater reach, uh, the sustainability of the sector, the increase of the sector, visibility, and uh, the expansion of the sector um, comes back to uh, things that, that everybody in general recognizes that there needs to be a greater investment uh, across all our communities. Um, and I, I think I've probably got off track a bit for your question there, but that idea of work life balance really does fall into that, that sense of it being an underfunded sector uh, and uh, that, that luxury of funding being part of what makes a sector sustainable and sustainability in terms of leading to those luxuries of balance between uh, the importance of engagement. Uh, we have a question from our audience online. Um, Sheila, you mentioned um, five expected outcomes of the arts, like creativity, disability, et cetera. What can researchers and stakeholders do so that these outcomes are valued and embedded systematically in schooling, where dominant discourses prioritize neoliberal ideas like competition, um, individualized learning, and so forth? So, how do we prioritize, how do we try and shift things and prioritize creativity in schooling? Not just mm -hmm. I guess, I guess, by demonstrating the big body of research that is available about the benefits of childhood access to arts and culture experience, particularly kids before eight. Although a lot of that research also shows that it's more impactful if it's done in the urban social environment. So that's quite interesting the balance between what's um, education in school and what's education in, in the home and, and your boring life. But I guess by better demonstrating um, in our own terms, in our own context, um, what those benefits would be um, to having more better in our education system. Um, I want to go back to your second question, Chris, and to Sheila's comment that arts and culture have done a good job of the together, whereas uh, there is some difference. So, I certainly believe in the name of the arts in terms of promoting social cohesion and giving voice to different peoples and in promoting tourism or educating kids. But what I find missing in tonight's discussion most of the time, and most of the time in discussion about the arts generally in our zeitgeist, is a sense of the arts as valuable even among themselves. Um, these uh, social Values of the arts are what come into play in the short term, and governments, of course, are in the short terms. But we don't uh, value Shakespeare enough for what he said about Jews or Denmark. We value him really for what he did with the language and staging and his psychological insights. It's it's sort of what he did for um, theatre and for writing in itself. And art, for art's sake, can sound rather Precious and rarefied, but in the end, in the long run, it seems to me that's where the value of the arts lies. And um, so much of the discussion about arts in our current period tends to turn it into uh, social work. Yeah. 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 The question there is around arts for art's sake. That's something that you talked about, Oren. Would you like to jump yeah. on that? <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, I talked a lot about, and I actually spoke to Martin Kemp, who's the big Leonardo scholar from Oxford, and, and he, he, he mentioned this idea that art is a function, but not a utility. And a function, function, but not a utility. The minute, and that's why I said that I'm reluctant to talk about the secondary outcomes of, of you know, art is working with new sets of knowledge as well, because it's really about the function of art by being useless, you distill the issues and the essence of what you are trying to deal with. The minute you start to think about those secondary outcomes with utilitarian outputs, and that's why I have the issue also with kind of monetizing it, you start to lose what the essence of art is and, and how we can come to terms, how we can you know, convince politicians and bureaucrats that this is, you know, because there's no matrix to, to, to measure it. And, and the impact can be, you talked about Shakespeare, you know, it can take 300 years to realize the impact. How do you actually allow that to happen? And give the space for artists to engage in those useless acts because they actually have a very important function in our society. This is, I suppose, the question we all need to ask. Can I just respond yeah, to that yeah. as well? I, I absolutely take your point, Dennis. And I think um, that's an important conversation to have when we're thinking about arts policy in terms of what new policy allows for and what it enacts. Um, but I also want to recognize that art for art's sake is an incredible position of privilege. And that, as you were saying, Sheila, not everybody has access to that privilege. Uh, and that part of the work of, of policy is to create the opportunity and access, uh, thinking about uh, our communities and our nations as a whole. And so I think part of uh, the tendency to talk about uh, value and social impact when we're having discussions of policy uh, is about ways of uh, leveraging what we understand the value of art, art trade. Uh, to ensure that policy can encompass that and that it supports it. Okay. Yeah, um, whenever it comes to, to funding, one should always look at the books. And I think governments, um, what they what they value is looked at by the budget and the millions and billions of going to the hospitals, and that's the arts. And we really have that conversation. That's a separate one. Obviously. Um, but what I'm really interested in was what, what Jeremy said about fellowships. Now, the number of artists I see who are dropping the practice or working, walking away from arts practice because there comes a certain point in their career where they're no longer supported, they no longer fit into strategies or engagement with youth, whatever. Um, they, they move either into administration or they just go and get another job completely. So in supporting people within the middle of their groups, moving onwards and sustaining that practice, I think that is so essential. And that's the same arts culture. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, I was a lot of friends when I was working with them, and that's the reason I bought for the number of fellowships to be increased by a few of the layers. Um, and we did, we increased, I think, from about um, two. <laughs> but still, I mean, I, I am a bit of a fellowship. I received, um, of course, the last few way, a $10,000 young people in the arts fellowship, professional fellowship, which in those days was like millions. Um, go, uh, allow me to go and spend time with me in Canada to sort of learn how to be a producer. And um, because I was sort of um, at that stage, had graduated from what I was doing um, lighting and production management and realized it was a stable pathway in that sort of career. Um, locally at that stage, where the sector was at. So I got that fellowship and went over to the producer's story. And so I think that for me has then sort of set my path. And I think this week we've just seen the announcement of the Sydney Meyer Creative Fellows, which are uh, eight, I think, unrestricted grants and $140,000 across two years to so, us. Uh, just there. And I think that's the one thing I mean, Aaron received um, in my final year in Moscow, uh, the Emerging Experiment Science Fellowship. So let's keep going to the global accounts. Yeah, uh, and, and I think, you know, so so there's some other countries that have different models where mm -hmm. artists, once they declare they're an artist, you know, they get like, instead of the doll, they, they would get the artists that would, that would allow them to compete, which is a great idea. But going back to uh, Jeremy's point, the very first grant that I received was a tiny, I think it was like $3,000 from Pika from R&D, but just the trust that was given to me as a young artist just coming out of university to allow me to start my project. And they believed, you know, they were more than willing to fail. The question was, can we use living tissue as a medium for artistic expression? 20 odd years ago, the question, the answer would be like a resounding no, but they gave us the money. 
So this, those small gestures of trust, it's not just about money, it's about recognition. And then I think we have also the, the older artists, as you said, that they are falling off with those kind of uh, initiatives and we need to somehow find a way to support them. Mm -hmm. Very similar, I suppose, to, you know, that's why so many artists decide to go into PhDs and as a way of they have a three year kind of fellowship. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> And we won't want to have time to unpack it now. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks very much for all the questions. So we have time. Um, one thing before we do, so I take one last question. Quick 30 second take from each of you. We've got all these talk a lot about what are the issues that we address and the challenges and the opportunities. What's the story to tell? What's the one thing that gives you hope about art and culture in Australia? And I think it's for me it's important to never some of the I can start if you like. For me, what, what gives me hope uh, in my, my work with Wesley in particular is just uh, the enthusiasm and passion of the artists, the writers we engage with, uh, the willingness of my wonderful super team people to contribute those volunteer hours, the phenomenal growth in submissions. Uh, you know, we, we receive up to 900, maybe a thousand submissions for each issue. Uh, which you know create a workload, but it's also really exciting to see that's a really dynamic, creative state. And this is uh, in the context of a sector that is unsupported and underfunded. So uh, I, the hope is in what could happen, what explosion, what flourishing could happen uh, with more funding. Thank you. Sure. Um, I guess I'm I'm optimistic that we're at such a tipping point in terms of the cultural values and how they are being expressed within our institutions, but also within our society um and i'm ruminating still more on dennis's question because you know at the heart of it all the journey that we're on together and separately in this place that we're calling can only be expressed in terms of myth and poetry because it doesn't make sense any other way and to create a space for us to create that mythology of our own and to express ourselves to each other in that in the language of empathy and so it's the only way to get past a lot of damage and hurt and healing, but to keep that, that optimism going that, you know, we're just broad human beings on a big, long journey that's beyond our comprehension, really traveling around in space until you get thrown by the sun, that's my <laughs> um, But yeah, you have to, you have to make that, the space for that kind of craziness in your thinking, otherwise it just won't be self -living. Absolutely. Or, yeah, I suppose, you know, being here for more than 30 years and seeing how finally Australia as a, as a country is actually recognized the wrongdoing we've done in the past. And the hope is that the same mindset would help us to have foresight not to continue going wrong. And, and I think culture has a huge uh, role to play. Uh, yeah, so thanks to the family seminar and thank the champion once again. I think finally we're seeing uh, new people telling the stories, new people being part of those stories, new people on stages and spreading. Um, in leadership positions of organization, we have a lot of money. Um, it's good because generating a lot more conversation and awareness and um, friendly space. Thank you so much. Well, please give a round of applause to everyone who's here. Thank you so Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope that you can have a good look also. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, really?